Skeptical critics like Bart Ehrman claim that the Gospels aren't based on eyewitness testimony, but are mostly legends that grew with telling. However, New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham defies that hypothesis. He argues that the presence of particular names is very strange unless they were the eyewitnesses behind the stories. Well, why exactly is that? Aside from the apostles and a few important figures, most people in the Gospels are completely nameless. Using the Gospel of Mark for an example, Jesus heals an unnamed leper, an unnamed paralyzed man, a demoniac, there's the woman with the issue of blood, the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, a blind man, and an epileptic boy. There is also the unnamed rich young ruler, the poor widow, and the woman who anoints Jesus' feet. These people are described, but we're not told their name. And that's just to name a few of the unnamed characters. Mark has 34 total anonymous characters in his gospel. Because these obscure people are often unidentified, we ought to take note when one of them is named. So for example, Mark mentions three little known persons in 1521. He writes, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. These names seemingly just come out of the blue, and they don't appear anywhere else in Mark. Matthew and Luke mention Simon, but they don't mention Alexander or Rufus. So what exactly is going on here? The early church fathers unanimously said that Peter's preaching in Rome was the basis for Mark's gospel. Peter goes missing after Mark 14, so how exactly would Peter or Mark know who carried Jesus' cross? Richard Bauckham argues that the source would have had to be Simon of Cyrene himself. And the mention of Alexander and Rufus implies that Mark's readers knew who they were. If Mark was writing in Rome, then it's very plausible to assume that the church had heard the story from the two sons themselves. I mean, think about it for just a second. What two sons wouldn't want to brag on their dad, the one who carried Jesus' cross? Neither Matthew nor Luke mention the two sons, so we could expect that their readers, areas besides Rome, wouldn't have been familiar with them. Now, let's look at Romans 16.13. It reads, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Now, it very well could be the case that there was another disciple in Rome named Rufus. It's not a completely uncommon name. On the other hand, Paul said Rufus's mother had also been a mother to him. Because Paul had never been to Rome when he was writing to the Romans, this shows that Rufus had gone to Rome from the eastern side of the Mediterranean where Jerusalem was. I wouldn't press this too far, but it is at least a very intriguing connection indeed. Now, for another example, Jesus appeared to two people on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, Cleopas and an unnamed individual. So what's with the mention of Cleopas? Of course, Luke wasn't there, but he does mention in his prologue that he has spoken to many eyewitnesses. Bauckham argues that it's very likely that Cleopas is the same Clopas mentioned in John's Gospel. John 19.25 reads, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Despite the slightly different spelling, Bauckham argues Clopas is a very rare Semitic form of the Greek name Cleopas, so rare that we can be certain that this is the Clopas who, according to the church father Hegesippus, was the brother of Jesus' father Joseph. Oh, so Cleopas was Jesus' uncle. The church historian Eusebius quotes Hegesippus, a Jewish convert who wrote around 140 AD. Referencing Hegesippus, Eusebius wrote this about Clopas. After the martyrdom of James and the conquest of Jerusalem, which immediately followed, it is said that those of the apostles and disciples of the Lord that were still living came together from all directions with those that were related to the Lord according to the flesh, for the majority of them were also still alive, to take counsel as to who was worthy to succeed James. They all with one consent pronounced Simeon, the son of Clopas, of whom the gospel also makes mention, to be worthy of the episcopal throne of that parish. He was a cousin, as they say, of the Savior. For Hegesippus records Clopas was the brother of Joseph. Now, we know from Acts that James was a leader in the Jerusalem church, and both Josephus and the epistle to the Galatians tell us that he was Jesus' brother. According to Hegesippus, Simeon was Clopas' son and was Jesus and James' cousin who replaced James after his martyrdom. So we can get why Cleopas' testimony would be such a big deal in the Jerusalem church. Finally, as a last example, the Gospels are full of accounts of healings and exorcisms. There is a handful of stories of people that were raised from the dead, but the only recipients of the miracles who are named are Jairus, Bartimaeus, and Lazarus. And while we don't have their specific accounts, Luke 8.2-3 tells us that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna were women who were cured of evil spirits and infirmities. With Jairus and Bartimaeus, we again see a character mentioned by Mark, but their name is omitted in one or both of the other synoptic writers. So Luke names Jairus, but neither Luke nor Matthew names Bartimaeus. 
Mark's audience were probably familiar with these two while they were unknown where Matthew and Luke were writing. As confirmation, we know of a 2nd century apologist named Quadratus. Eusebius quotes him in his church history, and Quadratus writes, But the works of our Savior were always present, for they were true that those who were healed and those who rose from the dead were seen not only when they were healed and when they were raised, but were constantly present, and not only while the Savior was living, but even after he had gone, they were alive for a long time, for that some of them survived even to our own time. Quadratus was writing to the Emperor Hadrian in 117 AD. When he wrote in our times, he was probably referring to within his lifetime, not necessarily from the time that he wrote. But this does show that the early church valued eyewitness testimony of those who received miracles from Jesus during their lifetimes. Here, it's as if Mark expects his readers to know of Bartimaeus and the daughter of Jairus as a living miracle within their midst. That these names don't fit the general pattern of anonymous characters in the Gospels should get our attention. These names seem to suggest that they're the authentic originators of the traditions attached to their names. This shows that the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony, and this isn't as well explained by saying they're just merely legend. 